Welcome back. In the last lecture, we showed that when we're looking at a sample, a random sample of a large population, you can look at the sample mean, which means the average of all of your samples, and that sample mean x bar will have an expected value which is equal to the population mean, and we also computed the variance of this random variable x bar, uh, and show that the random variable x bar has a variance which is approximately equal to sigma squared over n, where sigma squared is the population variance and n is the size of my sample. Little n is the size of my sample. And this is useful because what this means is that if I have a big population, I can kind of draw a random subsample and say something useful about that population in terms of the uh, sample mean x bar. Okay, and last time I mentioned that this formula for the variance of x bar being sigma squared over little n is an approximation for very, very large populations when big n, the size of my population, is really large. And today, this is a very technical video, I'm going to show you how to compute the, the um, variance of x bar not assuming large population size, and we're actually going to get and derive this finite size, finite population size correction term here. So this is kind of a technical video, but I think it's useful to see uh, what assumptions we're making and, you know, how you would actually do this if you had a modest population size. And remember, if the expected value of the sample mean x bar is mu, I want its variance to be as small as possible because that means that there's not much spread in x bar around that expected value of mu. And of course, I want my, my sample mean to be a good estimate of my population mean. Okay, so let's dive in. Um, the big issue last time was when we wrote down the variance of x bar, we plugged in this sum into this variance, and we made the assumption that the variance of a sum is the sum of the variances. And that's only true if each of these xi's are independent variables. But for a small population, every time I, I pull one sample, every time I, I you know, measure one of these members of the population, my population actually gets smaller for the next sample, and then it gets smaller for the next sample, and so on and so forth. And that introduces a small covariance between the elements uh, of this random sample xi. So I'm going to write down um, kind of a little lemma that is going to be important when we write down this expanded, more correct version of this variance formula. So the lemma, a lemma is just like a little theorem, a lemma, this lemma is that the covariance of xi with xj, if I have two random uh, variables, xi and xj, and they're in the same sample, then this covariance is going to equal minus sigma squared over big N minus 1. Okay? Um, if, this is important, if i does not equal j. If i equals j, then, um, then the covariance is just sigma squared. They're, you know, exactly covaried. Um, uh, and then how can I understand this? This is actually a beast to prove, and it's it's worse than what I'm just about to do. Um, and I, it's in my notes. You can, you know, I'm going to have a copy of these PDFs uh, online. You can follow the details. You know, this is in books. It's um, it's a, a technical result that you can prove, but it's it's messy. I want to give you the thumbnail sketch of why this is true. The thumbnail sketch is basically. Um, if, you know, if xi is sampled, and let's say xi equals one of these little x's, then new population is, um, has size n minus one, it's a little bit smaller, and the value of this random variable is less likely for the next random variable. I've already, if this one, you know, let's say that I'm polling people and they can say, yes, they're gonna vote for this person or no, they're not gonna vote for this person. If I've already sampled someone that was a yes vote, the pool of yes votes is a little bit smaller for the next sample xj. Um, and the probabilities change a little. And that's as much as I wanna tell you about this right now. This is just the intuition. 
Um, this lemma is true. You can prove it. It's kind of a mess. You have to do um, a lot of conditional probabilities to do it. And you know, maybe I'll do that in a future video. But just take for granted that the covariance between these, there is a small, very small, this is a very small covariance because n is still bigger. You know, n is big n is still, we assume that my population is not tiny. So this is still, you know, sigma squared divided by a relatively big number. So the covariance between two random samples is small. Okay, let's get into the proof. So we want very, uh, the, the, the variance of x bar. And so variance of x bar, var x bar, technically is the covariance of x bar with itself. This equals covariance of the sample mean with itself. And here I'm going to plug in this sum. I'm going to plug in the, the sum into both of these terms of the covariance. So this equals the covariance of 1 over n sum uh, i equals 1 to little n of xi, 1 over n sum, I'm going to change the, uh, rate, the index from i to j um, of little xj. And now this is absolutely true. There's no approximations being made. This is true. And if all of these x's are independent, i.e. if n is really, really big, then, um, then this will simplify a lot um, to this expression. But we're going to assume a small covariance here. Okay, so I can pop each of these 1 over n's out, and this equals uh, 1 over n squared times, now this one I actually can just sum up all of these covariances. This is the sum um, from i equals 1 to little n, from j equals 1 to little n, of the covariance of every xi with every xj. Okay, this is also true. This is just a property of covariance. Go back and remind yourself that this is, this is possible and legit. Okay, good. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this up into the case where i equals j. In fact, you know, so they're equal, and then we just re return a variance. And then I'm going to add up all of the cases where i is not equal to j. So this equals 1 over n squared times. Uh, there are exactly n cases where i equals j. So this is the sum from i equals 1 to n of covariance of xi with xi plus the sum over all other cases, all n squared minus n, where i does not equal to j, of this covariance of xi xj. Good. Now, this is where it gets a little easier. This expression here is just, I have n copies of just the variance of xi, of var uh, xi because covariance of xi with itself is just the variance. That's how it's defined. And here I have n times n minus 1. I have n times n minus 1. That's how many of these elements there are in the sum. That's how many ways i does not equal to j is n times n minus 1 times this expression here for the covariance, because all of these covariances are identical, actually. They're all equal to this, times minus sigma squared divided by big N minus 1, okay, times all of this stuff, okay? And so now I can actually write out this, and now it's just a matter of um, simplifying and adding things up. And of course, var of xi, this is just sigma squared, because we know that the variance of any individual element is the, var is the population variance. So this equals... Uh, 1 over n squared times n sigma squared plus uh, n little n times n minus 1 over big N minus 1 times sigma squared. And there's a minus here, so I can probably just, uh, oof, this is going to make a mess, um, but this is a little minus here, okay? So I can pop my sigma squared out. This equals uh, sigma squared I, in fact, I can pop my sigma squared out, and each of these has a little n. I can pop that little n out. So I get sigma squared over n times 1 minus little n minus 1 over big n minus 1. And I sure hope that's my correction. That is my correction. Good. Good. 
Okay, so that's essentially the correction factor using this lemma that these xi's and xj's are the slightest bit covariant for a finite population size big N. Okay, so this is how you would manipulate these things and get the right answer. Um, I still haven't proven this. It's really a mess, and I don't think it's worth your time uh, for me to go through two boards, you know, deriving this. It's in the notes. You can convince yourself it's true. Um, if I wanted to just do the absolute barest sketch of why this is true, we can write out the covariance of x i x j. We can write um, covariance of x i x j is equal to the expected value of x i and x j of this random variable minus the expectation value of x i times the expectation value of x j. This is mu and this is mu. So this thing is obviously mu squared. And I'm going to claim this is very hard to compute. But I'm going to claim that it's equal to uh, mu squared minus sigma squared over n minus 1. Okay, and this thing, you can compute this. It's a real pain to compute this, but you technically can compute the expected value of the product of two random variables, and you can go through all the conditional probabilities and, and work out that it's equal to this thing, and then you'll get your answer. Okay, it's in the notes. You can do this yourself. But if you take for granted that xi and xj have a very small covariance, because if you remove xi from the population, it changes the probability of xj in a certain way. If you take for granted this is true, you can get this nice finite end correction to your variance of x bar. Okay, and that's useful. We want to know what the variance of x bar is because we hope that as little n gets large, in fact, as little n gets large, this variance of x bar gets smaller, which is good because that means that as our sample gets bigger, x bar, our sample mean, becomes a better and better estimate of the population mean mu. Okay, thank you.